Sam, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. All right, we're going to get started. Welcome back to another Provident webinar. I'm your host, Ed Mann, Director of Training and Education. Tonight, I'm excited to introduce a panel of EMS subject matter experts to address national issues facing EMS. While I personally have not worked in EMS for several years, I remain close to many people who are still serving and are always willing to share their thoughts with me, many times unprovoked. Additionally, Provident does provide a variety of insurance services to EMS organizations across the United States, so I try to stay current with the issues. In a few moments, I'll have Steve Worth, A.J. Heitman, and Mike McAvoy introduce themselves. I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions, and we're asking you to use the question and answer feature to send your questions. We will make every effort to answer all of them. However, if we don't get to your specific question, we will get answers to you via email in the days following the webinar. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to review a little bit about what Provident Insurance is all about, the host tonight, and obviously my employer. Provident got its start in 1902 as an independent insurance agency in the Pittsburgh area. In 1928, they saw a need to start serving volunteer fire departments with a customized accident and health policy to help volunteers who were hurt while they were on the job and weren't being compensated correctly through workers' comp. Today, we provide volunteer combination and career firefighters and emergency medical responders with a multitude of programs. We also offer special risk and transportation insurance programs. Provident is, has been named the top, one of the top four in, uh, insurance employers for the last four years by the Insurance Business of America magazine. Quickly, some of the programs, as I mentioned earlier, our accident health program, which provides insurance for your uh, members should they get hurt while they're on duty. If you have our accident and health insurance policy, you're able to use our first responder assistance program. We also offer a 24 hour accidental death and dismemberment insurance, which provides insurance to your members if they have a accident off duty and should die. Group term life. We also offer critical illness and cancer policies. And of course our fire plus property and casualty insurance, which entitles you to be able to use our online training platform, the Fire Plus Academy. And for those of you who are uh, with the EMS backgrounds that need continuing education, the uh, training programs on the Fire Plus Academy are approved by CAPSI for continuing education. So tonight, without further ado, we're going to get into the heart of things on addressing the national, national issues facing EMS. Everybody's on, okay. So welcome everybody. I'll give you an opportunity here in a couple of moments just to, to introduce yourselves. I've had the opportunity to interact with each of our panelists over the years, either asking them for advice or being in a class they may have been teaching. And I can tell you that each of them is very passionate about EMS. Steve, we'll begin with you. Why don't you take a few moments and introduce yourself to our uh, guest tonight. Great. Well, thank you, Ed, for the uh, introduction here tonight. And it's great to be with you all. And uh, thanks to Provident Insurance. Uh, my name's Steve Wirth. Uh, uh, I like to call myself a young EMS dinosaur or, or otherwise known as an EMS artifact. I've been uh, active in EMS in the fire service since age 15 and starting in rural Pennsylvania, north central Pennsylvania, as one of uh, Pennsylvania's first paramedics way back when. Uh, since that time, uh, after a few years, uh, dozen or so uh, active in EMS and administration, I decided had this notion about going to law school. So went to law school and uh, had been practicing uh, EMS law, as we like to call it, at the firm page Wolfberg and Worth in Mechanicsburg, uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, all we do is represent and assist uh, EMS agencies, fire services, everything related to EMS to help uh, folks uh, deal with the tough issues that are out there and to help keep them out of trouble. So it's great to be here with uh, some fellow EMS artifacts on the line as well. Steve, I got to ask you, stay North Central PA. Where in North Central PA? 
That would be uh, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, oh, okay. starting, starting in the, the, the area of Nippinos Valley. Uh, okay. Six in Lycoming County, Very, uh, where I got my start. Very familiar with the area. Yeah. AJ, you're on deck. Tell everybody about yourself. Well, I'm a Scranton, Pennsylvania boy, and uh, at the age of 10, my dad snuck me along in the Scranton Fire Department ambulances and poisoned me into uh, loving EMS, and I've been doing it since uh, 1963. So uh, I am a dinosaur, and I'm pretty proud of it. And uh, my tracks have taken me from an operations director, from an EMS council director, um, out to GEMS, where I spent 26 years uh, working with Jim Page and Steve and all the whole gang from Page Worth, Wolf Burke and Worth, and and uh, just enjoyed that career. And then uh, this past year, I stopped uh, my involvement with Gems, and I'm with the Cambridge Consulting Firm, and I'm loving being able to do projects that are of my uh, expertise and uh, involvement. So I work with a great group of people, do a lot of lecturing, and uh, do a lot of teaching. Great, Mike. Last but not least. Yeah, um, so I'm Mike McAvoy, and I'm an EMS coordinator for Saratoga County in, in New York, and uh, I am a, a paramedic and a firefighter, a nurse, uh, a, a teacher, and an author, and uh, I've been involved in EMS uh, since college, actually. I started in New York City and then migrated uh, upstate, and uh, currently, I guess uh, some of my major involvements are I chair the EMS section for the International Association of Fire Chiefs. Uh, I'm the chair elect for the National Registry of EMTs and uh, have a few other miscellaneous jobs that I do. So are you ever home? No. <laughs> so, so Mike, if you would take, take a minute or two and tell our listeners about where you just returned from today and what you get involved with with some of your missions a couple of times a year. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just returned from Kosovo, and uh, I work with a gift of Life International, which is uh, the gift of Life International is a uh, international company, not company, it's a nonprofit, actually, that's uh, funded by Rotary Clubs from uh, countries all over the world to do uh, congenital heart surgery. So we treat children who are born with uh, congenital heart defects, primarily in countries that are um, underdeveloped countries and Kosovo is one example of a country that has no capability for doing pediatric heart surgery. And about 1% of uh, children who are born have some sort of congenital heart defect. And so in many of these countries, our goal is to do missions there and to develop a program in that country. And so in some of the countries we've been to, like I've been in Dominican Republic, uh, for example, for the last 15 years, on missions down there. And they now have a program where they're able to do a fair number of surgeries themselves. And we continue to return uh, to that country to help develop their skills and have them do more complex surgeries. So that's great. And I'm glad you're able to share that and share your, your expertise from the medical community with in underprivileged countries. And look, Two of our panelists made the statement that they're dinosaurs. They might be old, but I want everybody to understand something. They might be old, but they're damn sure current on what's going on with the EMS across the country, all three of them. So uh, they can't use that excuse. Uh, they might be, and look, I'm probably older. Well, AJ and I might be close to the same age. I don't know. But the bottom line is I know the three of them no EMS, regardless of how long they've been around or whether or not they're dinosaurs. And they're certainly nowhere near being extinct. So I just wanted to lay that out. Ooh, that's so look, a relief. I, I'm going to start with the first question tonight. So as I travel the country and talk to EMS providers, and even during my 14 and a half years, 10 years as a state fire commissioner in Pennsylvania, which was now over seven years ago, I heard then and still hear today that reimbursement for services rendered is woefully inadequate. So the question is, if reimbursement was an issue over 20 years ago, what if anything has been done to correct it? Are there efforts underway nationally to get it corrected? And what can EMS services do to help the cause? And Steve, I'll start with you since you're in the upper left-hand corner of my screen. 
Wow, that's really a loaded question. Uh, a couple of questions in one, but yeah, reimbursement is a top issue for sure. And uh, we are woefully underpaid. Uh, Medicare had done a couple of cost studies and found that. Uh, and there are efforts to improve it. I think one of the things that's gonna help a lot is the pandemic and the public health emergency. I, thought it, I think it's bring, brought renewed focus to how important EMS is as an essential public service in our communities. And in many states, we're finding municipalities starting to pony up and contribute more than they ever have before. That's one aspect of it. Uh, getting involved with state associations. We've seen a renewed interest in state EMS associations. The American Ambulance Association has done a tremendous job of advocating for our industry, despite the fact that we're up against the powerful uh, lobbyists that are you know, countervailing forces against us to increase our reimbursement. And Medicare is for the first time taking a real close look at our costs. Uh, we are now in the midst of a Medicare uh, data collection program where uh, essentially all ambulance services are being required to uh, provide information about their costs. Because as you all know, as we all know, <laughs> everyone listening, uh, when you've seen one EMS system, you've seen one EMS system. And we have a great variety of different EMS systems operating with different levels of funding from various sources. We need to get a handle on that. Medicare came about 1965. We only get paid for Medicare if we take somebody to a hospital, basically, okay? We're starting to see where the pandemic has now opened up some waivers and opportunities where uh, Medicare is looking uh, through a pilot program called ET3 uh, to pay for treatment in place, to pay for treatment to alternative destinations. Uh, and that's just the beginning. I, I think there are a lot of things on the horizon uh, that look favorable. I tend to see the glass half full rather than half empty. I've seen more activity in the last couple of years in terms of increasing reimbursement and getting greater focus on how important it is. But we've got a long ways to go. And as we all know, we need to do a much better job of showing our communities the value that we bring to our communities and what that truly costs. And that's an issue that I think we could probably talk a day on. So that's my opening line. AJ, oh, you're let, next. Let me jump. Well, I'm going to jump in, and I, my comments are really going to be action oriented because uh, <clears throat> when is the last time you heard of a ambulance service doing a report to the community? They just don't do it, and and I think that we need to start having a report to the community at least annually. It should happen soon. We should tell people that we're hurting with respect to recruitment and retention. We should point out the Medicare problem. We should ask for funding from our local governments to do telemedicine. And, uh, you, you know, you, you don't solve a problem until you know that you have a problem. And our government officials just assume that they're going to get an ambulance when they call for it. And the only thing we see today is when somebody says a volunteer system is going to go out of business or so-and-so went out of business for lack of volunteers or, or personnel. Everybody is hurting for staff. Um, COVID has had dramatic impacts on our finances, on our call volume, on our staff. And we have to make our government officials aware of it. They're, they're really not aware. Never have they been, I think Steve was right, been more aware than with COVID that you needed an ambulance and you couldn't get it uh, because it was uh, tied up on a COVID case or something like that. So we have to you know, make people aware and we have to make them aware of our poor pay parity. We do not get the same pay as our colleagues in the fire and law enforcement. And uh, there's not a municipality around that doesn't have a shortage of police officers right now. So while they're solving that problem, we have to throw a little bit of gas on the fire and make them sensitive. Uh, uh, politicians only react when they're sensitive to, to the voters and the voters need to know that health and welfare uh, around the corner may be delayed for them and then the political officials will, will cough up. Waiting around for Medicare, we could wait till, it, till, till the sun don't shine. We have to get local government funding and state funding um, to help us out. Uh, I'm not going to criticize all the money that we're sending to foreign lands, et cetera, but could they give us a billion dollars for EMS? Could they improve our communication systems and our staffing? Um, that's what we have to start pointing out. We, you know, the, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease and we have to do it. So, so Mike, uh, and, and I'm going to give you, believe me, Mike, you'll get a, a chance to go first with one of the questions. So okay. I'll, I'll do, a, I'll rotate it. So, so your thoughts on the same issues, Mike. 
Yeah, well, I, th you know, to tag along with what Steve mentioned, I think the cost reporting that uh, CMS is doing, they're mandated to go back to Congress with some information about uh, what it's costing us so that Medicare rates can be adjusted. Uh, private insurers tend to follow uh, some of the Medicare rates. Uh, I think that it's interesting to me that during the pandemic under the uh, declaration of uh, public health emergency that uh, CMS has uh, through a couple months ago, uh, paid out $10 million to uh, EMS to do treatment in place, which is separate from the ET3 uh, program that uh, surprises me that uh, so many EMS services took advantage of that. And that, that speaks very loudly to the need to have other mechanisms of reimbursement. And I think the other piece of it really is that I'm not so sure that we're ever going to be fully compensated by uh, insurers, including CMS, for the care that we deliver. I think some of that uh, reimbursement has to be met by the municipalities who really need to come to the table and recognize that they have a responsibility to provide EMS in their communities. And there's a difference between what we can recover from uh, insurance and from uh, the government uh, that has to be met by the local community. And I, I, I see that uh, very successfully in communities that have the resources to do that. But I also see horrible examples of uh, communities that feel as though they have no obligation to put money into providing EMS, you know, whereas they do that for police, they do it for fire. Um, it really needs to be something that uh, gets onto the plate of the uh, local government. So, so I, I want to step back. I don't want to leave this topic yet. So, Steve, you mentioned the pandemic, and and there's some momentum. I think back to the the first couple of years after September the 11th, and the government threw all kinds of money at the fire service and and emergency services across the board in most cases. But how do we keep that momentum going? I mean, it, 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 my fear is, is that kind of eight to AJ's point, at some point, the politicians, they're going to lose interest in it because the pandemic is going to be behind us. So what, what, what can local services and what can statewide organizations do to keep the momentum that we have right now? Well, I think they got to be in the face of their elected officials constantly, as AJ mentioned, you know, we got to get our communities behind us. You know, when I was up in Erie years ago, we started an ambulance membership program. Uh, that was a program that got people involved in, in the, in the uh, uh, community ambulance service, so to speak. And uh, lots of education needs to be done. And I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, we need to invest that time. It's going to take some time to do it. And we got to get active in our state associations. We have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, EMS agencies are not active in their state uh, ambulance associations, and they need to get a, to be a part of that. And uh, transparency, really showing the community uh, what this costs to provide services and the challenges we're faced and going to all the public meetings. I mean, <laughs> over the years, I can remember going to a lot of uh, local borough and township meetings and, and not, you know, not seeing too many people there from, from EMS. Uh, so we need to really be in the forefront, I think, and keep to keep that momentum going. Okay, AJ or Mike, do you have anything to add? Go ahead, AJ. I'll give you one more thing. Um, when is the last time you've seen somebody on a newscast that was a public information officer from an EMS agency? Fire has them, law enforcement has them, EMS doesn't have them. We need to have PIOs who are pushing out press releases, good things that are going on, needs. We can't get ambulance chassis now. Some services are not going to be able to get a new ambulance for two to three years. And, and the public needs to know that, you know, our maintenance bills are going to increase. All of those things need to be fed out there to show that we have ongoing problems. And, and, and again, we'll get the, the greasy wheel, we'll get the, the grease. Okay, Mike, anything to add? Yeah, I see there's a question in the chat about uh, rural services that cover huge amounts of interstate and have no uh, state or federal funding. And what about having NHTSA kick some money in for that? Well, the, the great thing about this is that uh, NHTSA just announced uh, multi-million dollar uh, long-term funding 
for improving uh, the rates of uh, people injured and dying on the roadways. And they recognized in that funding uh, grant that a significant piece of it needs to go to EMS. And so I think we're about to see uh, some money coming down from NHTSA. And in fact, probably right now is a key time for us to get our comments in on that to say what we think needs to be done, what needs to be funded. And NHTSA is for the next couple of weeks accepting commentary on how we think those dollars should be spent. And one of their key deliverables is reducing deaths on the highway. So yeah, I got to tell you already, we're getting hammered with questions and stuff in the chat already. And I'm going to, I'm going to look, and that's great. I, I, that, I don't think we've ever had this, these many questions or comments come in this early before. Uh, so I, I'm just going to look through here. Some of them are simply statements, paid and paid fire and PD and fire considered essential services, but despite, despite the obvious EM is not, is not in most states. I couldn't agree more. And I think the panelists would agree with that. Uh, here's if, if you read if you read the chats, there, there's an action plan in the chats. Uh, making sure that we're an essential service. If you've put that out there, then you need to educate people that we're an essential service. So we we know what our problems are, but we've been sitting on our haunches too long and we got to get a little bit more vocal. Okay. So there's there's a comment in here. Uh, significant failure rate of EMT students when they attempt to pass the EMT exam in our county, Northwest PA, over the past couple of years. What are the root causes of this failure and how can we help the next generation of EMTs and our PA volunteer fire departments? What barriers need to be removed for their pass rate? Fellas, I haven't taken an EMT class or looked at an EMT exam in years. So uh, anybody want to weigh in on that? I can comment on that as the chair elect of the National Registry. Um, when you look at uh, pass rates on the National Registry exam uh, going back for the last 10 years or so, uh, there is not a change in the number of people passing the exam. First time pass rate uh, for all levels runs somewhere around 67 to 70% of people very similar to other professions, nursing, physicians, and some of our other medical colleagues, where the issues are when you start to see um, high failure rates on the exam tend to be with the quality of the educational program. The exam is always evolving and it's keeping up with contemporary curriculum as things change. What doesn't always evolve though, are the programs that are teaching the people. And I think that's where you start to see some issues with uh, failure rates keeping up. Well, okay, so, so to, uh, to, 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 go ahead, Steve. This, if I may, just, I think, you know, we really need to work on getting our youth involved in EMS. You know, back in the day, I, you know, I was involved in an explorer post as a teenager and that helped spark my interest in EMS. We're not doing enough to mentor the new younger generation and get them interested in how EMS and why EMS is such a noble profession and why it is uh, such a valuable thing to be involved in and, and how it can be very personally rewarding. Uh, mentorship, we, we need to work on that. I'm on the uh, Lighthouse Leadership Committee for NAEMT. We're putting together a uh, mentor-mentee program. We're getting that kicked off. We're just not doing enough of that. Too many of us uh, older folks are retiring and not uh, passing the, the torch to the next generation in a proper way. That will get more people involved in EMT training. That will get, you know, the more people certified. That's, that's ultimately, I think, uh, the issue is getting a bigger pool of people interested in EMS. AJ, hey, do you anything you want to add? No, I, I agree with Steve 100%. I, I, you know, just... You know, we have Bible study programs. We should have EMS study programs. Uh, agencies should invite the kids in to, to give them a little anatomy, physiology, get them hyped up, let them do ride-alongs. And uh, every one of us here would tell you that the, as soon as we went on our first call, even as a ride-along, we were hooked. And, uh, you know, the show emergency did it for us, for many of us, and uh, we have to take that to the next level. So, so Mike, I want to pick up on something you mentioned it earlier it came from rural Nevada. And the, the question is, is how do you feel about grants from, from 
the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to help with the cost. And to Michael from Nevada, if I heard you right, Mike, you're saying NIST has already started to do some of this? The folks from NHTSA are actually in the process now of uh, coming up with ways to spend a large allotment of money that has been directed at uh, so, highway. So, all right. So how would somebody like Michael in rural Nevada learn more about that? And, and, and when the time comes, he's there with his hand out saying, where's mine? <laughs> well, and th this is why I mentioned that I think it's imperative for us to comment on it now. So there's a comment period that's open for the next couple of weeks to submit comments as to how we think that money should be spent. And I think one of the knowledge gaps and NHTSA and not, not to slam the people in the office of EMS because they make up a very small um, pimple on the face of uh, NHTSA, but we, we as a community need to say, here are some things specifically that can be funded in EMS that will help to reduce uh, highway fatalities. And that has to do with the care that we provide at the scene, the training that we give to people and the funding for rural EMS, particularly where a lot of these uh, highway deaths occur. So Mike, at some point, if you could send Sam and I the link to the comment period. So when we send out the emails after this webinar, probably tomorrow, we can put that link in there so people can, that, you know, look, I, let's face it, but, you know, there are a lot of small ambulance services, both paid and volunteer across the country, that it's kind of like this information, what you just mentioned, is probably new to probably a lot of our listeners tonight. So if we can get the information out to, to folks, I think it would be great. Uh, Teresa B., I see your comment here. I'm an advocate and work on the Hill and maybe can help. I'm a former reporter and could write press releases if you need them. Depending on how many you need, I could I can try and do them pro bono. Uh, Teresa, I'm not going to give anybody your email address or you'll probably never get anything else done. Uh, but if you can contact us, I'd like to have a conversation with you when this is over, maybe tomorrow at some, at some time. I see comments in here about pay. We've already talked about that. Uh, I'd like to comment on that further. Sure, Steve. Uh, yes, pay is inadequate, no doubt about it. Uh, what we pay our EMS practitioners, and that's what I think is the better phrase to use these days, EMS practitioners, is uh, woefully inadequate for the value of the job that it brings to society. But things are moving forward. Wake County, North Carolina EMS just announced that they're doing across the board increases upwards of 29%. We're seeing sign-on bonuses. We're seeing uh, a lot of areas that are starting to pony up additional monies for salaries and benefits. Quite frankly, two years ago, before the pandemic, if we'd have uh, predicted, if we would have seen these kinds of increases, I don't think we would have seen them had it not been for the pandemic. But it's just a start. There's no doubt we're underpaid. Uh, when we see the good news coverage about New York City and some of the stuff the mayor said there, which was sort of... Uh, <laughs> not very favorable toward EMS. We need to be in the face of these elected officials and say we need to have parity, as AJ used that word earlier, parity with the other essential public services. And yes, several states have now passed legislation to recognize EMS as an essential public service. That's what we need to do. We need to be holding signs in front of state capitals that say, make EMS an essential public service, which opens the door to increasing pay much more than it is today. A long way to go, no question about it, but I, I see a lot of positive movement there. Okay, there's a comment here. Three, three of the five last EMT students we sponsored used it to gain entry and now into med school or medical programs with no interest in staying in EMS. And I'm sure that all goes back to pay and benefit and all those other things, I mean, who wants to stick around in a profession when I can move on to something else and make three times the money and, and not take near the abuse? Well, uh, the average tenure is three and a half years now from the last study I looked, wow. looked to. And it's short, okay? But here's the deal, okay? Leadership has to retool itself, okay? This is the other problem. We have a leadership structure that is, is still working in the old days, okay? 
we know instead of saying to the folks, well, gee, you're just going to stay with us for three and a half years. You know, why should we invest in you with more pay? We should be thankful they're with us for three and a half years and make the best of that three and a half years. The fact that people want to move to other professions, that's going to happen. We can't stop that. I don't think we can because people are looking at, I mean, what they're paying nurses, travel nurses, some of the wages they're making now, Mike can speak to this better than I can, but I was just speaking to some nurses today, uh, $1,500 for a shift, you know? I mean, it's like, what? <laughs> Where do I get a job like right. that? So, so it went down through here and, and, and as I look through these, I agree with the statement that AJ made. And, and I'm sure everybody that's watching this can see the, the, the comments. The answers to a lot of the things we've raised so far, and we're not even to question number two in my script yet tonight. So I, I want to move on or we'll be here all night long. We may have to do another one of these a week or two from now or in another month uh, because th th this is great, the feedback we're getting so far. So we talked about reimbursement and along the way, recruiting dropped into it so you know look i I've, i know about the fire service recruiting and retention issues and I, I i know it's safe to say ems is having the same issue in recent years and the covid pandemic seems to have created even more issues i also believe inadequate pay and benefits have a direct impact which obviously can be tied to the reimbursement issues so I think you know where the question's going. What do we do to get more people in the door? Look, I got to tell you a personal story. My son worked for a local EMS service from the time he was 14 as a junior. He got paid, got hired there as an EMT when he graduated from high school. And they offered to send him to medic school. He's a police officer today. Okay, he's a police officer. And I'll tell you exactly what he told me. He said, Dad, I work with some great paramedics. But I don't want to look like them when I'm 30 years old uh, and, and, and not be making any money and have to work at three different places to make a living. Uh, and he went to the police academy and now he's a local police officer. So I think we've already talked about some of these, but AJ, I'm going to let you go first. What do we do about recruiting and retaining? Well, first, we have to have a plan. You have to have a, a, a business plan for how you're going to do that. You know, we have to set some money aside for uh, education. We have to set some money aside to uh, reimburse people for some of their things. When I, when I was a, a volunteer officer in Pennsylvania, uh, one year we set aside $40,000 for our volunteers, and, and a paramedic got so much because they were maintaining their paramedic. If they drove the rescue truck, they got $100. If they did firefighting, they got $100. And, you know, the average person who was a paramedic firefighter was a volunteer was going to get like $3,000. And you know what? They voted it down. You know why? Because they said they had to pay taxes on it. Well, of course you got to pay taxes on it. 50% of what I'm going to give you, you're going to have to pay taxes on. But if you have a good program, you're still going to walk away with $1,500 in your pocket. Give the government half of it and, and and you walk away with some of it. So there has to be an investment in this uh, in this whole thing. Uh, I will tell you now, if anybody needs a job, you contact me. I know people that'll give you a signing bonus that they will, you know, uh, help you with relocation. There are agencies around this country that have discovered that recruitment programs really work. You're going to have to look outside your, your, your normal realm. And I'll tell you the other thing, and God love the private services. They have a hard time with reimbursement. It's a vicious cycle. They can't pay more because they have to make a profit to be able to continue on with their service. So the, the, the wages for the commercial ambulance, EMT and medic, are much lower than a, a governmental entity. And, and that's a problem. So, uh, But there are people that are, you know, uh, 2,000 people apply for a fire service job near me in California with only two openings because th there just aren't that many openings in the fire service because they're, they're, they're civil service. And, and so we have to start looking at this like a business and, 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 uh, and recruit our people the proper way. First of all, let people know that you're having a hard time. Those of you in the rural areas, if you have a Grange Association or a Farmers Association, you go to them and tell them that you're hurting and, and explain to them, we'll send you to school. 
you know, there, there is a department in, uh, in, uh, in Delaware that they will take an EMT and they'll start paying him on day one to become, a, he's not even an EMT. They'll send him to EMT school on their dime. And then when he comes out, he just has to, he'll get reimbursed over time, over three years. And so there, there are innovative ways we could spend all day on this, but there are innovative ways that you can get out there. And I'm sure Steve and, and Mike know them as well. Mike, any comment on a recruiting retention, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think that it's kind of a two-prong uh, two issue and, and we need to be more nimble with recruiting. You know, GMR has an Earn While You Learn program, which has been very successful uh, in the communities where they've done that. They, they do exactly what AJ was talking about. They hire somebody, they pay for them to go to EMT school and they're riding on the ambulance during that time and, and being paid uh, to do that. The other thing I think, and we're looking at this very carefully, the National Registry right now is working with the International Association of Firefighters to launch a uh, congressionally funded um, apprenticeship program. And you think about all the opportunities that exist for somebody coming out of high school to be a plumber, an electrician, uh, a mechanic, and, and yet, when they come to the fire department, uh, in order for them to be a paramedic, we have to send them away to a program for a year, when in fact, uh, you could do the same sort of apprenticeship type learning in the firehouse as you can do for other trades. And so we're going to look at that very carefully and figure out a way to remove the obstacles that are in place that prevent people from being able to learn while they're actually on duty to make it easier for the fire service, make it easier for um, marginalized people. I mean, there are individuals when you're out there looking at the community who uh, can't get a job in a fire department because they don't have a driver's license. And so those are things that are obstacles to a lot of people in, in communities around the country. And so we want to look at this apprenticeship thing as perhaps a way to recruit some more people. On the other hand, though, I think one of our issues is retention. And if you don't have a good culture that uh, people are enjoying the work that they do, uh, you don't have good retention. And I just came back from the American Ambulance Association Stars of Life um, Awards Banquet down in Washington, DC, where they had 125 people who were recognized for their contributions to EMS by their services that sponsored them and sent them to Washington to this award ceremony. And in my comments that I gave to the group, I said that of the 125 people, 101 of them were recognized not for heroic deeds that they did and not for lives that they saved, but because they are heroes in the workplace. They're people who other people love to work with. They're excellent teachers. They're wonderful dispatchers. They're people who encourage others to enjoy the work that they're doing. And I think that that's a huge uh, piece of it. When you, you talk about recruitment, if you're not doing something equally as valuable to retain people, then you're going to have an issue. And I don't disagree with Steve. You know, in, in my workforce here in Saratoga County, we lose a good 15% of our workforce every year to medical school, to nursing school, to other medical professions where they can earn more money. And we're very happy about that. We're happy that they spend time with EMS, that they grew and learned while they were with us. And, you know, we see that as a step for them to, to move on to something better and something they won't forget later in their career, which I think is valuable to all of us. Well, right. yeah. I'd like to tee off on what sure, Mike Steve. said. I think, you know, Mike is so right. We really got to focus on our people more. And I think that starts at the top with leadership and adopting a, a servant leadership mindset where we spend our job as leaders is to take care of the caregivers, okay? And a lot of services are doing excellent work in that area, especially in the area of provider mental health. We have a serious problem with suicide rates and just general PTSD and other uh, you know, mental health illnesses that afflict our, our, our folks. And we need to really pay attention to that. But that's how, let's talk about getting more pay because ultimately I'm seeing a lot of comments on that. Well, we need to step out of the box and just not sit back and wait for insurance or just argue and lobby with insurance companies and Medicare. We need to be partnering and collaborating. 
To me, that's the thing that we have been adequate in doing in a lot of areas. Partnering with our local health systems, partnering with, believe it or not, our insurance companies that pay us, uh, MedStar Mobile Healthcare in Texas. They've done a great job of uh, working with their local health systems in contracting with them and providing services to those health systems to prevent readmission of patients. And they're getting paid good money for that. Insurance companies, we've got the, uh, the big No Surprises Act that now affects air medical services, that there's a commi committee now studying it for implications for the ground ambulance services. About 17 states have passed uh, No Surprises Act legislation already, which means they're saying you cannot balance bill the patient, okay, for certain health services. In some cases, EMS is excluded from that. But guess what? Insurance companies today are more likely to be interested in contracting with you. And now more than ever before uh, is the time to you really work with those insurance companies to try to uh, become a contracted uh, member of their plan, be an in-network provider, so to speak, if it works out. But they're more receptive now to paying us realistic money for the services we provide than ever before, because they're finally realizing Health systems and insurance companies are finally realizing that we can save them tons of money by keeping people out of the hospitals. That's the other thing COVID taught us. Where's the last place you want to go when you get sick during the pandemic? To a hospital, right, Mike? You know, and uh, we're saying, let's treat people at home, treat them in place. Let's, and insurance companies are saying, wow, we could send paramedics to the home and they can do these things and keep the patient out of the hospital, which is going to cost our plan thousands and thousands of dollars. Just a, a few other thoughts to help boost up that pay that needs to be boosted. There's no doubt about it. We need to keep that moving ahead if we're going to keep and retain good people. That's all. I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> Shut up. Well, I, I want to jump on it for a second, and that's to tell services that they need to have a joint meeting with all of their hospitals and tell the hospitals what the issues are. The issues are that the cash register is connected to their emergency department door, and we bring them patients. And and we can also stop bringing them patients that would overflow their ER. And, and like we said, the insurance agencies would be glad to, to kick in some money for a treat and release. Um, so we have, to, we have to work with the hospitals. Ask your hospitals to fund your employee assistance program for your volunteers or piggyback you on, on to their plan because they have really good employee assistance programs. And a lot of volunteer departments don't even know what they are. And, and mental health and, and the welfare of our people is something we have to take care of. So I, I want to move on because we have lots of comments, but we've got 15 questions in the Q&A we haven't even, haven't even looked at yet. So th this, is, this has been great. I got to say, someone says, I like the idea of the apprenticeship program. Sounds like a great idea. That's kind of thinking outside the box. Someone commented that learn to earn programs working well for their EMS staffing. So uh, there have been some great ideas thrown out here tonight, just in the, in, in the comment section because of what you three have brought to the table so far. But I wanna move on to the next question. Uh, so obviously I work for an insurance company who provides insurance coverage to protect people with a variety of specialized policies. We also insure property and equipment with our property and casualty insurance. To that end, I have access to information regarding claims. Vehicle accidents and intersections and backing accidents account for many claims and claims related to patient handling account for large payouts. While the number of claims for human resources related issues is not significant, the dollars paid out for those claims is pretty significant. So Mike, I'm gonna start with you this time. What advice would you offer to organization as it relates to emergency response? And then I'll get to the second part of the question. Well, I have, <laughs> I have a pre-dereliction about uh, how we respond uh, to emergencies. And so I've always been sort of passionate about reducing uh, use of red lights and sirens and of uh, making a better job of call screening in the 911 center. And I think that uh, we're finally headed in the right direction. We have a national uh, study going on that's uh, put together by the folks from the uh, NAMSQA group, the National EMS Quality Alliance, that's looking at 
uh, reducing red lights and sirens responses, and it has enrolled 50 agencies across the United States uh, for a time period of a year where they're going to formulate best practices to try to reduce um, the use of red lights and sirens during responses. They're kind of predicating a lot of what they're doing on the folks in Nova Scotia who uh, have knocked their uh, response with red lights and sirens down to about 15%. And uh, that's somewhat of an astounding number. But one of the things that we know is that if you reduce the response to calls with red lights and sirens, uh, you'll reduce your use of red lights and sirens during transport as well. And so I think both of those things are important facets for us to pay attention to. And uh, I think we're, we're finally starting to nationally recognize that that's an issue. And I think uh, we're going to do something about it over the course of the next year or so. Okay. So the second part of the question then, Mike, is what should organization, organizations be doing to better protect themselves from the human resources issues, such as wrongful termination, sexual discrimination, toxic workplace environments, et cetera? I think that's a question for Steve. <laughs> well, he's going to get his I'm turn. I'm going to get my uh, bite at the apple. I, I, I already saw him jumping up in his chair when I brought it up. But but if any any advice you would Go offer ahead, there, Mike, Mike and then uh, Steve's going to get his chance. Yeah. I, well, it goes back to what I said earlier about um, retention. You know, I think creating a culture um, that helps to keep people in the organization makes them feel wanted, makes them feel recognized for what they do, gives them feedback on their performance and, uh, and puts them in a, a non-adversarial position with their employer is probably the key to a lot of that. I know my home agency has an, an absolutely amazing culture where people are happy to be there. They're happy to go to work every day. And the administration of the organization creates a culture that makes people want to stay there. And we don't see those sorts of allegations of sexual harassment or, um, you know, wrongful termination or that sort of thing. You know, it's people, we always say, uh, we don't fire people, they fire themselves. <laughs> and, you know, you, you call someone in and say, what did you do this for? Um, they, they basically recognize that, that they're, they're reaching the end of their rope in a, in a situation where you, you might all, ordinarily have an adversarial sort of a situation. So I think a lot of that has to do with the culture that's created. And like you said previously, it starts from the top and it comes down to the bottom of the organization. And if there's not a good culture at the top, then there's never going to be at the, the workforce. So AJ, yeah. you're next in line. Any, any uh, advice you would offer as it relates to emergency response? Yeah, I'm, uh, well, emergency response, obviously. I, I, everybody who's on here should download the joint statement on lights and siren vehicle operations on EMS responses. Just Google that. And, uh, you know, for the first time in, in recent history, uh, 15 organizations from fire to EMS all the way down to American Ambulance Association were involved in helping to craft this statement. And it really says that we have a problem. You know, it says that... Uh, 1,579 ambulance crashes, and most of them occurred when we were using lights and sirens. So it starts from the top. Um, we have EMS managers who demand that their crews run lights and sirens all the time because they have performance contracts that require response times. We have to start with changing that. And so there's crews that are shorthanded. They're being forced to work overtime. They, they can't delay a response because they feel like they're going to miss a call and they're going to get in trouble for it. We can't get people in trouble for turning off the lights and sirens. And, 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 and there are medical directors that I see in chats every day that are coming out with, with uh, SOPs and policies, medical policies, about the use of lights and sirens. And, and it just, we, we have never been able to have anybody show us that it saves more than maybe a minute. And, and, and the, the devastation and the deaths that we see uh, from ambulance crashes are they're just intolerable. So, so, so to a point that Gordon Graham makes in one of his risk management classes, slow down, just slow down. So, so AJ, to the second part of the question, what should organizations be doing to better protect themselves from human resources issues 
such as wrongful termination, sexual discrimination, toxic workplaces and environments. Steve, you're going to get your chance. I see you chewing well, on your lip. Golden. Number one, they should be leaders. I, I agree with Mike. It starts in the top. Uh, a, a good EMS leader is somebody who, who welcomes concerns and questions and addresses them. If you don't like your partner, come see me. We'll get you a different partner. If somebody is harassing you, let me know. Uh, there are EMS leaders that don't, aren't even on Facebook to know that their crews are, are chastising each other. I had a person who worked for me years ago that I saw on Facebook complaining about people that were harassing him through social media because he made a mistake at work. And, and I thought that I should call him and I didn't and he committed suicide. And so with suicides up and with all the harassment that's going on, social media could be a blessing and it can also be a curse. We have to be very careful about what our people are posting. If you work for me and you're on social media and you're giving out patient information or information and criticizing another ambulance crew, I need to call you in and have you stop that. To Steve, last okay. but not least, quick, quick chew right. in your lip. It's your well, turn. Well, you know, as a defender of uh, EMS agencies for 25 years in the area of workplace law, uh, Mike said it well, it starts at the culture from the top down. But the vast majority of the workplace related claims are preventable with good management training. I'm still appalled to this day, the lack of training that we provide to frontline supervisors on the law related to sexual harassment, uh, discrimination and so forth. So we really need to focus on training our managers and our leaders to be uh, following the law and to be rooting out bullying and discrimination and in, improper con conduct and so forth. Increasing diversity. We have really need to work on this a lot. I mean, just look at the screen here. We got the, you know, four old white guys here, okay? We need to get more women. We need to get more people of color and diversity from the younger generations involved in leadership positions and that's mentoring. And uh, that I think can prevent a lot of those kinds of claims significantly. There's really, uh, you know, it's, it's such an area that I believe can be controlled. Uh, two other comments, patient drops, that's another area. We've seen an increase in litigation involving dropped patients. And a lot of that has had to do with, I'm sorry to say it folks, but laziness and not paying attention to the patient and uh, focusing on our phones rather than the patient's face and uh, not adequately dealing with lifting and moving and just not paying attention. Uh, some of the cases we've dealt with recently uh, have focused on that. And lastly, on the crashes, Everybody I agree with, absolutely. We need to have more evidence-based measures. The problem is we've, we've hoodwinked uh, the society in a believing that speed is what saves lives. And it doesn't, as we know. The clinical evidence shows that as Mike mentioned, there's just a few small cases where getting there quicker does make a difference or getting the patient to the hospital makes a difference. But those are really rare and isolated and the risk is significant running red lights and sirens all the time and the evidence is replete with how ineffective that really is. But get us off of that sacred cow, good luck, okay? That's a big challenge, okay? Uh, we need to change the measurements of what is a successful EMS system away from response times, more toward clinical outcomes. How quickly did we get the patient on oxygen or do we identify a life-threatening rhythm? How quickly did we get, uh, get them into the cath lab? The, the clinical measures need to be in, in place to better measure our system's effectiveness. So that's it, I'll stop. So, so if it, to, to AJ made a point earlier about working closely with your hospitals, if you want that clinical information that you speak of, you need to be working closely with the hospitals because that's who's gonna provide that kind of data to you. Absolutely. And the trend is toward interoperability, sharing of information among healthcare providers involved in the care of the patient. We still have a lot of barriers associated with that. Uh, we worked with Nemesis in, on, a, on a paper, a white paper, to address those barriers because a lot of hospitals to this day throw up the HIPAA flag. Oh, we can't provide it. And that's a bunch of crap. OK, it's not true. OK, they can provide it. Are they legally required to? No, unfortunately. And that's where we need to, to, to do a lot of education. You're, you're very right on that one, Ed. Okay. So AJ, you're first on this one. So of, of late, you can't pick up a professional EMS publication 
or see a post on social media where people are talking about patient offload times and how it's impacting their ability to provide services. Please share your perspectives on the issue and how you see it impacting the overall EMS network. And are there any efforts underway to address the issue? You know, again, I'm gonna go back on my soapbox. You gotta meet with your hospitals and tell them we are not gonna sit outside with a patient in our ambulance for two and a half hours because you don't wanna take them in because of COVID or any other issue. We'll go to some other hospital. You know, they are causing us in some cities to lose ALS units for literally a whole shift and, and we can't respond to emergencies. So the hospitals are really part of the problem here and they could be part of the solution. So, so the second part of that is, is if they're having these problems, they need to be dealing with the hospital administration, not a charge nurse, not the ER doctor, but the administration at the hospital. Yeah, some of the some of the best systems that I ever uh, worked with or consulted with, uh, like university hospitals in, in uh, Cleveland, uh, they have 125 member agencies and they meet with all of those squads and they're very responsive to their needs. Uh, we need to have EMS captains and others who have monthly meetings with the hospitals to go over these issues. Uh, there are some that don't even know the name of their hospital administrators, and, and that has to end. We have to, we have to get involved with them. They're big business right now. Hospitals are big business. And, uh, you know, like I said, the cash register is hooked to them. They have to understand that uh, we have a cash register as well, and we can't put money into it if we can't go on calls. Okay, Steve, you're next. Yeah, regarding uh, ambulance patient offload times, the, the crux of the problem is bed delays, and it's a hospital staffing problem that is uh, hospitals are, are, are putting on to us and making their staffing problem our staffing problem. Uh, a good source of information is a three-part series that my partner Doug Wolfberg and I wrote related to, uh, and the title of it is Ambulances Held Hostage, okay? It's a three-part article series. It is the uh, most widely read article series uh, posted on EMS One the past six months. So take a look at that. Google EMS One and Ambulances Held Hostage, and you'll find the three articles. We offer numerous suggestions and ideas on how to educate administrators, because AJ's absolutely right. You got to be at the top. You got to talk to the administration, the top people, the compliance officer, the CEO. They need to know what's going on here. And uh, they need to recognize uh, the, the impetus here because they have obligations under federal law, under MTELA, to provide an emergency screening exam promptly upon arrival of the patient on the hospital property. They can't make you wait in the parking lot. But unfortunately, we are shocked to find that a lot of nurses and staff in the emergency departments don't even know their legal obligations under MTALA. And uh, so in any event, I think, uh, take a look at that three-part article series. It offers a lot of good practical tips on working with and collaborating with your hospitals and uh, in some of your legal rights to take unilateral action if necessary. Because we can't have a person 10 blocks away from that hospital. You're sitting on the wall for three hours waiting for the hospital to decide when they're gonna accept your patient. Meanwhile, there's a patient with a heart attack 10 blocks away, you can't get access to an ambulance. Are you kidding me? You know, shouldn't so happen. I, I made note of the article and Sam, I know you're listening. I want to make sure that we include that link in the email that we sent out to everybody that participated tonight or those that signed up but didn't sign into the, so we could get the word out to folks. Uh, it's another way for us to help. So, so Mike, I want to, I, I don't want to ignore you on the question, your thoughts. Well, Steve uh, alluded earlier to the amount of money that nurses are getting paid now, and yet that's still not filling the vacuum uh, that we see in hospitals. And I, I work in both sides of the, the field in EMS and in the hospital. And I can tell you that in my ICU right now, 70% uh, of the staff are uh, traveling nurses, nurses that the hospital rents in order to fill vacancies that they're unable to fill uh, locally. And this is not going to change if you talk to healthcare administrators. Uh, they anticipate the next five or six years that they're going to have this shortage of nurses. And one of their solutions to uh, fixing that is going to be to hire paramedics to take the spot of um, 
the aides that are there, not necessarily replace nurses, but facilitate the nurse being able to care for more patients by having paramedics working in all these different units in the hospital. And while uh, that sounds somewhat insulting, it's, it's happening now. And uh, so New York State and the state of Texas both did some analyses of the total number of certified providers in their state and how many of them actually completed a patient care report in the last year. And both states came up with the same number, 50%. So half of the certified providers are actually out in the field working in EMS. And we know that a lot of them are working in healthcare clinics, they're working in hospitals, they're working in other settings other than EMS. And they're working there because they make a whole lot more money and they have better benefits. And so I think uh, that the long-term effect of that is going to be positive for us, that we're going to see that trickle down into EMS. And in order to staff our 911 business, we're probably going to end up having to compete with ourselves <laughs> in that situation with hospitals. And, uh, and overall, that will improve the nature of it. But it also means for educational programs and you know, we think seriously about this in the National Registry is, you know, we're cranking out 40, 50,000 uh, newly certified providers every year. That doesn't even meet half the need for the number of providers that are moving on, going somewhere else. And so in some way, shape or form, uh, one of the things that we have to do is get more funding for educational programs and bolster those so that we can crank out more providers. And, and I don't think there's a shortage of, of people who want to take some of that training, but there's a shortage of the availability of that training and the funding for it. So I would say that, that that's part of, of uh, where we're going from a workforce perspective. Okay, great. So I'm going to move on to the next question. And I'm going to start with you, Steve, because AJ's got first dibs on the next question, because he made sure that it was included in the script. So he's, he's first on the next question. But in today's environment, everybody with a phone can be an instant news reporter. I see more reports of EMS personnel getting themselves in trouble because of things they post on social media sites. And I know what the answer is, but I want our listeners to hear it from you three. What advice can you give the managers or organizations to aid them in reducing or eliminating the the potential fallout from the issue. Uh, it, it becomes well, the fire yeah. service is guilty of it as well. It's not just yeah. EMS. So, 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 so are police in some cases. So, right. well, I think we have to start with the realization folks that we are in a new age of transparency and accountability. Just look at the news, look at what's happened to police, look at what's going on with EMS uh, in terms of the ability of anyone to pick up a device like this, this is my golden retriever on the back here, and video everything that's going on from the moment the ambulance leaves the station. So we are under the microscope and we have to make sure everybody knows that and that we conduct ourselves accordingly. That means having good policies on the use of social media, make sure it doesn't violate uh, individuals' uh, rights to privacy, that it doesn't violate their HIPAA rights to their protected health information, and uh, make sure everybody's trained on those policies. Uh, and a lot of it is just teaching good common sense and respect. You know, if you respect each other in the workplace, you're going to respect the patients. And there has to be mutual respect back and forth uh, through all levels of the organization. And if you have that kind of culture, you're not even going to think about posting anything uh, on Facebook or social media or Instagram or whatever that would not only embarrass you, but violate the rights of others and be uh, downright uh, disrespectful and hurtful. So, um, yeah, I think those are some of the things we can do because, uh, you know, doing something stupid on social media is a quick way to end, end your career, uh, you know, and unfortunately, <coughs> folks, as we all know, they have yet to invent the unsend button, okay? And when you send it, guess what? Somebody is going to go, oh my goodness, look what Steve posted. I'm going to take a picture, a screenshot of that now because he's going to realize in about an hour, how stupid that was. And guess what? Here it is preserved, you know? So, you know, man, oh man, it, it, it's a, you know, transparent world we live in now, and we just got to learn to live within it. So, so Steve, since you're a lawyer, have you, have you had to defend anybody 
<coughs> excuse me, or represent anybody that's that's made this mistake to this point. Oh yeah. Or an amp, maybe an ambulance service has fired somebody because of it. And oh yes, absolutely. We we defend and represent ambulance companies. We typically don't in, represent individuals. We're you know we, we generally represent the agencies. But, you know, we educate and, and that's the key. But uh, yeah, I mean, we've had some crazy cases, you know, what people post. I mean, we had one case involving an EMT who's in the back of an ambulance posting on Facebook board, sitting here in the back of the ambulance, transporting another gomer to the hospital. I uh, can't wait for my shift to end, you know, and it's time stamped that he's in the back of the ambulance time he doesn't. I mean, stupid stuff like that. And yes, we've had to defend employers. And I will tell you that under the eyes of the law, the employers are on pretty square footing when they terminate individuals for that kind of inappropriate conduct. You know, even if it doesn't violate HIPAA, the employer has an interest in protecting its reputation and preserving order. <laughs> you know, if you let one person do that, you know, everybody else starts doing the freelance, uh, we can put whatever we want on Facebook. And by the way, unless you work for a government agency, there are no free speech rights under the Constitution. Your private entities and nonprofits are not generally uh, covered by the uh, Constitution. Uh, so, you know, so anyway, we could do a whole hour on that. Okay. Subject. Mike, your, 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 your turn to weigh in on the topic. Well, I, I guess I would say the same thing as I've said a couple of times before. Again, it comes back to, to culture. You know, my, my home organization here in, uh, in Clifton Park, New York, has a public relations person in the organization. And she uses every channel of social media to push out information about the agency. And she works with members to help them to uh, push out information about the agency and teach them, mentor them uh, things to do, not to do. And, and certainly in a, in, a, in a just culture where uh, you can sit down with people and say, look, that wasn't such a bright idea, uh, the thing that you posted. Um, I think that we have to recognize that in today's society, especially with uh, some of our younger folks, they're very accustomed to uh, every single form of social media that there is out there, a lot of things that, that elude us because we're, we're not used to using some of the channels that, that they use. And so I think having the ability to, to mentor people and to uh, model for them what you consider to be good behavior is probably a really important uh, facet of preventing those sorts of bad occurrences from happening. AJ, you have anything you want to add? Yes, I'll tell you the favorite song of my wife, Betsy, who's been uh, very tolerant of my EMS career and my leadership positions for many years. And and uh, she sings the song, Wait Till the Morning, uh, when I used to get upset by somebody who had a comment about something about gems. Uh, I'd be, you know, having a sip of wine and I'd be ready to fire off something and she'd say, wait till the morning. And that's the best advice anybody could ever give you. And, uh, you know, it, it just live by social media, die by social media. Nothing you're going to say to somebody who's upset is going to change their mind. I've found that over the years. So, you know, if somebody wants to criticize the call that you were on, they, they're not in your same shoes. Uh, just just social media, there's departments that have cell phones that are issued at the beginning of shift, and that's the only cell phone that you can use. Uh, I'd rather have people be disciplined in it. But unfortunately, there's very few people children included, that are not addicted to their cell phones. And that's a, that's a growing problem nationwide. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next question. And AJ, you're first, because you suggested this question. No discussion about emergency services, and that includes the fire service, would be complete without talking about mergers and consolidations. And even more services moving to a combination system of career and volunteer services. So do you see this becoming more prevalent nationally? Can you cite any examples where mergers and consolidations have worked? Just speak to the topic generally, mm -hmm. since you're the one that wanted me to ask the question. Absolutely. I first saw it develop in police departments, colonial, regional police, and, you know, people felt that they had to have their own police department. And then they began to realize that by, by having a regional system, they could do more with less. And I, I think you're going to see more and more of that. I am seeing more and more of that. 
Um, I'm also seeing more agencies that are merging and putting more BLS trucks on the road. Atlanta is going to be putting BLS trucks on the road and, and for many years was an all ALS system because quite frankly, most of the people that we manage can be managed very well by two exceptional EMTs. We don't need paramedics on every single call. You look at the system in, in Washington state where they have medic units and they have aid cars and the aid cars handle most of the workload and the private services, most of the transports. And the, a, a medic in Seattle has been a medic for 25 years. That tells you something because they're only being sent on high acuity calls. So yeah, uh, regionalization, uh, it's a bad word. It used to be a bad word, but more people are realizing it. Rather than go out of business, if we merge with our next door neighbor and, and uh, we, we consolidate our resources and our finances, we'll be better off. And, and county governments are more responsive to it now than ever. And maybe Steve can comment on that. So, so for organizations, especially smaller volunteer organizations, and, and, and again, I live in PA, so I'm thinking of some of the smaller counties in PA where there's only three or four ambulance services to begin with. If, if, if they're thinking about this, what advice would you give them as they begin the process? I mean, should they hire a consultant? Uh, should they start it on their own? I mean, you know, uh, they're, because first of all, these ambulance services aren't going to have a lot of super managers to begin with. They're not going to have a lot of resources to begin with. So to find a consultant that's not going to break the bank to help with the process, that's what I'm looking for. How, how can these smaller organizations get started? You can use a consultant or you could find a place where, where it's worked. And you go to them and say, what were the growing pains? What happened? I know in, in, in my agency, when I was in Pennsylvania, as soon as we started paying people, our volunteers all said they wanted to get paid. And that was the demise of that. And there's other agencies that have, you know, certain programs that the volunteers can participate in, as well as uh, an insurance ALS crew that happens to be on duty uh, and, and patrolling. So, you know, find there, any one of us, you could ask us for agencies where it's been successfully done. And, and we'll give you that advice. And you just go talk to those people. Yeah, and I think going and meeting with your neighbors, you know, the three companies in that county you mentioned, Ed, just sit down and talk about where do you have common ground? Where can we share resources? Start there, because you don't have to start with, you know, merger discussions. You start with sharing resources and communicating and discussing how you're going to cover each other's area and so forth. That's a start, because some areas, as we know, don't even do that, you know, and there's still somewhat of a rivalry between. But the sustainability of ambulance services that run such a few number of calls, it's really hard, especially in uh, going into the future. Now, on the other hand, there are some areas, I was just out in South Dakota in February, where you know you can't merge because you're, you're the closest thing to, <laughs> to medical help for a hundred miles around, you know, and there's nobody to merge with, number one. And if, if there is, they're, they're too far away, really. So, um, but there are so many areas where shared cooperative things can be done. And it all starts with getting together and talking with your neighbors and having regular meetings. And, you know, I hate to use the word meeting, but getting together, you know, and getting to know each other. So you break down some of the barriers that have been there in place for many years. I know, Ed, you're a great uh, historian of the fire service and you know, Pennsylvania, when you look at the number of volunteer ambulance services, I can remember working with a borough that had six fire companies. And why did that little borough have six fire companies? Because back in the day in around 1900, we didn't have telephones and we had wards, you know, political wards in each in those boroughs. So there's six wards and everybody had to be within an area to respond when they pull the game wheel box thing and the horse and buggy, the horse drawn fire engine goes out the door. It was a neighborhood fire station and those evolved into fire companies. and we just kept going, you know, we've heard, you know, you know, the phrase, the fire service is, you know, uh, 250 years of tradition unimpeded by progress. You know, we've heard that before. Uh, I, I, want to, I, I want to give you a dinosaur. I got warning. Ed going here. Let, let Ed talk. Go ahead, AJ. No, I go ahead, well, here's, AJ. Here's the dinosaur warning. <laughs> Years ago, the hospitals ran the ambulance service and they gave it up because they realized it was a loss leader. And then we took it over, we meaning us in general, and now hospitals are gobbling up ambulance services because they think that's the thing to do. 
And guess what? We're going to come full circle again when they realize that reimbursement and it's the loss leader and they can't control where the patient goes. So if you don't control your own destiny by regionalizing and, and merging with your groups, some hospital is going to come in when you're faltering, take it over. And then 10 years from now, they're going to give it up. Yep. Yeah, we I, have I, seen that. I've talked to fire departments about mergers and consolidations. And if you have an opportunity to control your own destiny, do it now or someone else is going to control it for you. It's that simple. And, uh, you know, another thing that I keep telling people and I still list from the, the former chief, Alan Brunacini, it's all about Mrs. Smith. Yeah. And if people that are going through these negotiations could just simply remember it's about Mrs. Smith and not themselves and not the color of their ambulance or the color of their fire truck. It's all about Mrs. Smith. And, and if they ask themselves two questions, will the public be better served if I do this? And will my organization be better off if I do this? And if the answer to both of those questions is yes, you don't have any choice in the matter but to make it work. Right. I just saw a great comment by Alan. Start the discussion now when I you're saw not the same failing. One. Yep. You know, get together when things are okay, when you don't have a crisis to deal with. Uh, and start to know your neighbors and, and work on it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a great you know, comment. That, that can be done in, in a very simple way. I mean, you yep. think about all the things that could be done. You can do shared purchasing. Yep. Uh, you can share some of your administrative expenses, some of your administrative duties between agencies. There's a lot of small things that could be done that help to reduce the costs to the individual agencies. And, right. and then you get to a point where somebody's struggling and then it just becomes logical that their neighbor who they've worked with so closely uh, would be a logical um, joinder for them, you know? So, so I'm, I'm done with my questions, but we have 20 questions in the Q and A that I'm gonna open now. And some of these might be just comments so I'm going to, let's see, John Ramos, sir, some EMS systems are considered not-for-profit receiving funding from charging insurance and Medicare, which should cover operational capabilities. Now here in New York State, volunteer ambulance services are being paid medical and other benefits. That appears to be a comment. Uh, oh, wait a minute. What we need is to lobby the state legislator, legislature, New York State Commissioner of Insurance, to mandate timely payment for services. Our ambulance sought a, a tax district with an already heavily taxed community. We're not doing enough recruitment. Uh, so let's see. That's more of a comment than a question. Another... Yeah, I will add one thing, and that Mike sure. knows New York's been very proactive about uh, maybe it's New York. There's some of the states uh, that have offered uh, uh, tax incentives for volunteers and, and other people that, you know, give them a tax break. Um, I personally like the retirement benefit. You know, Acadian Ambulance is an employee-owned company, and they have a tremendous culture at Acadian. And if you're an Acadian employee and you're with them 20 years, you will retire with close to a million dollar retirement. That's a fact. And, and that's just because they've invested and, and it's employee owned and each of the employees gets invested in, uh, in retirement benefits. So, you know, if, if I could go someplace and, and put in six hours a week as a volunteer and end up with a couple hundred dollars when I ready to retire, uh, that's an incentive for me to keep going back to that place. So, so Joyce Keller has a comment on here, a way to get younger students involved, perhaps we can offer EMS training in the PA technical career centers. Is this idea even, I see that happening more and more uh, where in high schools, they're offering it through the career centers. Uh, I know in Pennsylvania, there were uh, legislation passed years ago that allow school districts to offer those programs within the schools and it's actually part of the student's curriculum, but the, the administration has to make the, the uh, make that possible. Aaron well, Roan has a-, a, a Yeah, a, I was just gonna comment on that. Go a ahead, lot Steve. of our clients around the country have realized they've got to start their own training institutes. They're okay. starting their own institutes. And not only that, they're paying their students to go through school. 
guaranteeing them a job. And uh, that is, has been effective uh, in a number of cases that we uh, are aware of. So uh, that's you know, one solution because our, our training system just hasn't kept up with the turnover and the changes with the pandemic. You know, a lot of those programs just weren't there to design to provide the number so of people. Aaron, Aaron Roan has a question for the panelists. How would these panelists encourage people to stay current with things happening in the EMS system both at the local and national levels. And who, whoever wants to jump on that one first. Well, get involved in your state association. We've said that a couple of times. Subscribe to the different EMS publications. You just click on there, you know, and, and get, get on their list and read the stuff. You know, uh, you know, that's one way of doing it. And go to an occasional conference and get together with people and share and network with others. I think that's something that uh, we need to do more of. I hopefully... I, the conferences I've been attending in the last couple of months, I've seen good turnout and uh, it's been refreshing and people are re-energized to share ideas again now that we're getting uh, away from, you know, being locked in our homes and communities. So uh, those are a couple of quick thoughts. Anybody else, Mike or AJ, you want to add anything? Yeah, I, well, say, I think you're going to go ahead, Mike. No, I, I'd say the same thing as Steve. I think, you know, you have to pay attention to the EMS publications that are out there, uh, gems.com, ems1.com, um, you know, subscribe to other, pay attention to what goes on in the National Association of EMTs. The other thing a lot of EMS providers don't realize is that the uh, NAEMSP, the National Association of EMS Physicians, um, takes members who are non-physicians. And there's a significant constituency of EMS providers in that organization. Mm -hmm. They have a great deal of money and put out a great deal of good information and run some great forums uh, for their members. So uh, you probably, in, in many states in the country, also have a state uh, association that is uh, attached to either NAEMT or the NAEMSP group. And those are all uh, channels to get involved with. And then your state has an EMS regulatory body and uh, is probably based on the years ago, highway traffic safety funding um, broken down into regions. And so you have regional councils all over the country. Uh, those are opportunities to get involved at a local level and uh, find out what's happening. And uh, you know, <clears throat> Not to not to uh, uh, make any jokes about the fire service since we've done that already. Um, the the fire service is is a very politically savvy group, and uh, when you look at regional councils, uh, as soon as the fire service wants to get involved in an ambulance somewhere in the United States, they appear and they start taking place, uh, taking actively participating in government and regional councils and uh, having a voice in, in what happens there. So uh, I think we can learn something from that. You know, If you wanna have a voice in what's going on, participate at the regional level, at the state level. Yeah, I, that's great stuff. And get involved in the local government association, the statewide you know, township supervisors association, they do conferences. Get involved in some of those local government uh, educational forums. Because uh, I know we did a few in Pennsylvania uh, through one of the ambulance services that did it on their own. And we were surprised at how many elected officials came locally who didn't even understand how reimbursement worked. They didn't understand. So we got to get on their agenda, you know, and, and also educate them. Yeah, very good point. AJ, you want to add anything? Yeah, I would say just like you found out about the series that uh, uh, Steve and Doug did, go on to PWW and see what's on there because they post stuff all the time. Uh, on Cambridge, who I work for, we post stuff all the time. Uh, and, and you got to troll the web in the morning. I did it as an editor in chief every morning. I looked at our competition and others to find out trends of what's going on. If you have a problem, you you just Google that problem. And I guarantee you're going to find an article or, or um, something in one of the scientific journals, uh, like on ambulance accidents, the data is out there. When you're going to a city council meeting, all you have to do is bring that information in and lay it before them and, and you'll have all the ammunition that you need. So, so without sounding critical, would it be safe to say those that want to know make the effort to find out and those that don't, though, simply don't make the effort? To a great extent, oh, I, I agree. Mean, I think it's still <laughs> education is key. I just did a project, believe it or not, for uh, EMS World, and uh, it's going to be a 60-page supplement that'll come out June 1st. 60 pages of information on hidden trauma. 
And, and as Mike can tell you, you know, people are not putting traction splints on and people are dying. They're not using pelvic binders. They're still using archaic uh, uh, sheets to try and tie up a pelvis that's injured. And so we went to the experts and we actually have video clips from autopsies to show how much blood can accumulate before you get ever even palpated out at the scene of an incident. So we're trying to change the course of EMS by, by that particular supplement. And, and I will tell you, of all the things that I've done lately, that's going to save lives. Those 60 pages are a must read. So AJ, when it's available, if you'll let me know, I'll make sure Sam advertises it through our various social media platforms so we get the word out to people. The, the, the next one's more of a comment. We're only considered essential when someone needs us. I think that goes to the point that everybody made tonight. If you want people to consider you as essential, you got to get out and tell your story. You got to get involved with the local government. You got to go to the Kiwanis Club, the Rotary Club, the movers and shakers in your community and let them know who you are, what problems you're having and what kind of help you need. Anybody disagree with that? No, good point. No. Uh, I, I would tell you that it's EMS week. It should be EMS week, 52 weeks out of the year. You I, should be doing something every week, assign it to somebody, something every week of the year, not just during EMS week. Yeah, that's a real good point. What are we doing this week to recognize those on the front line serving the patients? That's really what we need to focus on. Uh, another comment about another learn to earn program that's being started. Uh, uh, the, the comment about mental health with no stigmatism. I, you know, I, I'm going to make a comment here. If you're a leader in an ambulance service and someone in your organization needs help and you allow someone to pick on them or make fun of them, knock it off. Knock it off. If you're a leader in this business, I don't care if it's EMS, fire, I don't care where you work. If someone in your organization is having problems and people in the organization are picking on them as a result of it, you better put an end to it. Step up and lead and put an end to it and get the individual the help they need. Amen. And Google the articles on EMS sleep deprivation. There's a lot of work that's been done now. Sleep deprivation is as deadly as, as alcohol is. And uh, it, it has no place in EMS. We have volunteers and paid people that are going from job to job to job, hoping to get a, a, a few winks and they don't get it. And they're making medical errors. So sleep deprivation, as well as CPAP machines could be life-saving. There's, there's about a third of you out there that have sleep apnea and you don't even know it. If you're an ambulance service, get all your people tested for sleep, sleep apnea. And if they need a sleep machine, get them a sleep machine. So, so here's a, uh, Steve Hoffman. So we talk about pay of our practitioners. Then in the same breath, we talk about the volunteer ambulance corps. I believe this is part of the problem. We're having an identity crisis on exactly what our service is, what it does, who provides it, what, what is expected of it and who pays for it. What municipal municipalities ambulance is going to be forced to provide the service when other ones don't even show up and so on. How do you move forward until these are answered? Uh, that's a mouthful. And Anybody want to comment? I think we need a whole other uh, webinar on that one because I have a host of ideas for you on that. Okay. Um, you know, you, you, you reap what you sow. If you have a good culture, like everybody said here tonight, um, then you could do it whether you're a volunteer or otherwise. Some of the some of the best organizations to deliver EMS, Virginia Beach, for example, the oldest volunteer system in the country, and they're still getting tremendous volunteer support, and and that's because they have a great culture in Virginia Beach. If you think about it, it is somewhat of a conundrum. I mean, we have roughly 1.1 million EMS providers in the United States. The majority of those are EMTs, but literally half of them are volunteers. And that, that creates a, a dichotomy where you have a group that requires a significant amount of extra money to pay for the staffing. And then you have another group that uh, doesn't have that expense, but yet 
those are people that answer calls in a large portion of rural America. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think the volunteer system is going to go away in those communities. You need it uh, because those communities are, it's the, it's the nature of rural America and, and, uh, and that's not going to change. So we got to work within that uh, system and also uh, work on ways of, uh, like AJ said, there's some great combination departments. You know, we've seen a lot of departments that, you know, bring in some help during the day. Uh, in particular, when the volunteer shortage is more acute, uh, that sort of thing. So yeah, a lot can be done here. Uh, we're not going to solve uh, the world's uh, EMS structural problems in an hour and a half now webinar, uh, but uh, that's a hint, Ed. Uh, but uh, we certainly can, can get a start on uh, you know, tackling these things. And uh, there's been some great ideas here uh, tonight, I noticed, a lot of great uh, input which is what I like about this platform. Everybody can see everybody's comments, even if they're not questions, there's some great comments and suggestions, some very passionate, and we certainly need that passion to solve our problems. Okay, I'll, I'll, give, you my, I'll give you my final comment, and that's for people to open their eyes. I can walk in just as Mike gets around the country and Steve gets around the country and they invariably they invite us to see their ambulance station or their crews. I could tell you in five minutes what the culture of that organization is. Yep. If I open the back doors of the ambulance and the sheets are wrinkled and, and the, the cabinets are not fully stocked or things are hanging out or there's an empty O2 tank, I can tell you the culture of that organization. I can look at the table in the lunchroom and if yep. it's messy, that's <laughs> the same way you deliver care. And if I go in your bunk room and the beds aren't made, that's the culture of your organization. So take a walk around your building and, and be self-introspective about, about who we really are. Well said. I'm, I'm going down through here looking for specific questions. I see a lot of comments in the uh, q and I I don't see a lot of questions. Uh, it, it, here's something from John Ramos to you, Mike. If at all possible, please have, please have Mike McAvoy reach out to me mayor at village of walden.org in lower new york state orange county in the middle of a controversial ambulance tax tax district thank you looks like he's looking for some help mike uh yeah i, I speak for everybody else anybody who has any comments get them back to you farm them to us and yep. we'll help you yeah if you're looking for help and and i'm getting ready to close things up because one of our presenters tonight was kind enough to join us from the U.S. Virgin Islands, and I know he wants to get out and enjoy some sun in the beach before it's all over with. Uh, now, in all fairness, he was there teaching all day, okay? He wasn't down there hanging out. He was teaching all day. So, look, Thank I you, appreciate Ed. everybody being with us tonight. Uh, and <clears throat> if it, the, the thing I want to throw out to, to the three of you if there is a specific topic that you would like to do a webinar on where you're teaching something, let me know what it is, and we'll certainly work into the schedule. It gives you an opportunity. I make an introduction. You do your PowerPoint and actually educate people on things. So if you have a topic that you feel really uh, uh, strong about that you would like to deliver in the form of a webinar, you let us know. We'll do our part to, to promote it and give you an opportunity to do it. So uh, any closing thoughts or words of wisdom from, from, from our panelists to our listeners? I think I said enough. <laughs> All right. Well, and I think we're happy to be participating because we get as frustrated as you out there get frustrated and we want to help solve your problems. Mike? I guess what I would say is, you know, now is the time for all of us to be open-minded and to listen to those folks who work for us. And maybe some of them have ideas that we haven't thought about before. You know, and I've heard some really unique ideas around the country in the last year or so that are coming from people who probably have some insights into what goes on every day in EMS that could solve some of the, the problems that we're facing. And I think now is the time for all of us to, to be open-minded, you know, and our national organizations really need to start flexing and be a little bit more nimble. And, you know, I know we're trying to do that at the national registry. And I think we need to do that with all our national organizations and say, 
let's think outside this box because it's not working uh, for us presently. So to, to a reminder to everybody, we'll be uploading this presentation to the Provident YouTube page. If you'd like to watch it again or share it. As a reminder to our listeners tonight, we'll be sending out a very short five question survey at the end of the program. Please take time to complete it. You'll also, for those of you that stayed throughout the entire presentation, will receive a uh, certificate from Provident via the email in the next several days. If you have any questions or need additional resources from today's uh, webinar, or you have an idea for a future webinar, please email us at info at providentins.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. All of the things that we talked about tonight that need links sent out, Sam's gonna make sure those links are sent out in the email afterwards so you have access to the other information that was shared. Uh, the bottom line is this wraps up another Provident webinar. Thanks to our panelists for being with us tonight. Please stay tuned for our schedule of upcoming webinars and podcasts. Until then, stay healthy and stay safe. Thanks again. Have a great again. EMS week. Take Thanks care. Thanks for what you do.